you understand what I'm talking about, uh, because I'm going to lay some of the same similar ground where I'm going to lay, is I want to show you tonight how we walk in revival in the middle of the mess. I'm going to show you how we walk in revival in the middle of the mess, and I'm going to show you in God's Word where God's Word shows us the exact answer for everything He shared. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 We can walk in revival today. Amen. We can walk in revival right now. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you in God's Word we should be walking in revival right now. Amen? Irregardless of what's taking place in the world system, God's people should be walking in the full power of the Holy Spirit. This is the day and this is the hour and this is the season when God has called us and equipped us and prepared us to go out there and bring in the harvest out of the mess. Amen? That is a harvest field, that mess he described out there. The world that has rejected Jesus Christ is a harvest field for the body of Christ. And this is the greatest time and the greatest hour and the greatest season, I believe, for re evangelism and revival that the world's ever seen. Because even the world has enough sense in many cases to realize that something is terribly wrong. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? So if you want to go to Psalm number 2 tonight, I mean, you're going to find it interesting where I start out. And uh, I, uh, years ago, I was uh, worked in managing a halfway house, a Christian halfway house. And uh, there was one particular gentleman, and he uh, he was a what was called pre-trial federal prisoner. In other words, the federal government told him everything, and they set his schedule for him and told him everything he did. And one of his requirements was he had to go to counseling. I remember he came back one day, and his name was Eugene, and he was so frustrated. He'd come in my office and just threw his stuff down. He says, I'm never going back to that counselor ever again. I said, well, the federal government says otherwise, but what's wrong? He says, because all that guy does is try to get in my business. I said, that's kind of what counselors do. They get in your business, and then they charge you a lot of money for it, but that's kind of what they do. <laughs> And he said, he said, oh, okay. And uh, so I just, I kind of going to share some things tonight. And as we were leaving the house, I, I told Rachel, I said, you know, I just really kind of wrestling in some ways with what God would have me to share tonight. And uh, I said, you know, he just seems like he's giving me these messages sometimes where I feel like I'm just kind of getting in people's business. And so I'm kind of maybe go against the grain in a couple areas tonight a little bit and hopefully challenge us. Yeah. to walk in revival and hopefully challenge us to be the people that God has called us to be in the season that we're in and hopefully challenge us and empower us so we are never ever intimidated by the darkness that Pastor Mark described that we're walking in revival Psalm 2 verse 1 starts out why do the heathen rage. Yes. Why do the heathen rage? What is going on? Why is this world in such a state of rage and turmoil? One of the things we've got to understand is we cannot accept the world's definition of what is going on. Right. We cannot accept the world's definition of what is wrong. And I believe in some ways that the body of Christ has accepted many of the world's definitions of the problems that exist today. Beloved, I, I, just, I have to tell you this, it's not a political problem. It's not a political problem. What's going on in this planet is not a political pro problem. I mean, we listen to them, one party blames the other, don't they? If you ask the Republican Party, what's wrong with the world today? It's the Democrats. If you'd ask the Democrats what's wrong with the world today, they say it was Republicans. If you ask a socialist what's wrong with the world today, it's capitalism. And if you ask the capitalists what's wrong with the world today, it's socialism. And we can go on down the line, but I would tell you today that that's not why the heathen rage. That's not why the heathen rage. Some people might say, well, it's an economic problem. If we just had our finances right, we wouldn't have any of these problems. But it's kind of funny that you and I and most of us have lived in the strong economy the world's ever seen in, the time, in my lifetime in the United States of America the world's probably never seen a stronger economy so economics are not the problem some would say racial injustice and as awful as that is that's not the problem that's not why the heathen are raging so I want to take a moment and just kind of go back in time 
and ask that question, why do the heathen rage? We can go all the way back into the book of Ezekiel. And there was a time when Satan himself was, was in heaven. It says that his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. And when his heart was lifted up because of his beauty, it tells us that he began to think in a crazy way. I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to exalt my throne. I'm going to ascend into heaven. You see, something was taking place that the, the rage that we're talking about was rising up in his heart and he was beginning to rebel against the authority of God. See, that's where it all began. It didn't begin on the political scene. It, it didn't begin with an economic problem. It, it didn't begin with racial injustice. It began in the heart of Satan in, in ages gone by. Yeah. Why did the heathen rage? And, and what was it all about? And we know what Satan did. He then came into the garden one day and walked into the garden and Adam and Eve was there. and He began to rage against the authority of God and the means of deception. Has God really said to you that if you eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, that you'll die? Well, yeah. Oh, you won't die. You know that's the oldest, the oldest lie there is? You can sin and not die. You won't die. He was raging against the authority of God and using deception to do it. And we understand that, that, that man did bow his knee and... Something happened at that moment inside of mankind that that rage that was against the God and against his authority suddenly then was beginning to rise up in the heart of mankind. Because the Bible then says that man was by nature children of wrath. The nature of mankind changed at that moment. And a lot of times we don't really stop and consider that much anymore. and we, we don't hear that taught and spoke about very much. You know, when I was younger, my nature was different. My grandmother was, my grandparents were the only Christians I had in my life. And, and it, at times they would, you know, my grandmother would invite me to church. And you know what I thought? I thought that was the craziest thing I ever heard. Why in the world would anybody go to church? I couldn't comprehend that. Why would you go to church? I had never been in a church service. I'd never been in a church service prior to my salvation. Why in the world would somebody go to church? You see, because I had a different nature then. My nature then was, why would I do that when I could go do drugs? Why would I do that when I could go to the tavern? Why would I do that when I could go out and party and run wild? That was my nature, was, that was natural to me, was to do drugs. People have asked me before, why did you start doing drugs? I always say, because it had never occurred to me to say no. Never crossed my mind to say no. I thought everybody did drugs. It was my nature. I was a natural born sinner. Now, I won't say that about you guys because you might get mad at me, but myself, I was a natural born sinner. It came natural to me. It wasn't hard. It was easy. I never had to go to school to learn how to sin. I never had to be trained to know how to sin. It was natural to me. It was my nature. But then when I came to Christ, suddenly my nature changed. And now I'm in my natural habitat. This is my natural habitat. In my natural habitat, this nature worships God. This nature loves the Word of God. This nature loves fellowship with God's people. This nature loves to pray. This nature loves the fellowship with God. I now have a different nature than I did at that time. But the problem with the world, it's not a political problem. It's not a social problem. It's not an economic problem. The problem with the world and why the heathen race is because mankind is corrupt at the very core of his being as a result of sin. Amen. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the heathen rage? Because of sin. There is a, a time in Mark chapter 7 and the Pharisees, they, they had this big drawn out ceremony where they'd wash all their utensils and stuff when they'd eat to show how clean and holy they were. 
And one day they came to Jesus and his disciples and accused them of not being holy and clean because they weren't doing the ceremonies. Well, Jesus said, don't you understand? It's not what goes in man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the heart of man that defiles him. And he went on and gave the list. He said, you know, out of the heart of man that some of the things that come is evil thoughts and adulteries and fornication and murders and thefts and blasphemy and pride and foolishness. Why do the heathen rage? Because it's in the heart of fallen man. Why do the heathen rage? Because mankind is corrupt at the very core of his being. Yes. That's what we are delivered from when we come to Jesus Christ. Knowing this, that that old man was crucified with him, that we would no longer serve sin. Yes. I've gotten funny. Sometimes people come and they go to the altar and want to get saved. I say, what do you want to be saved from? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should teach you. The mankind's nature changed. But have you ever thought about the fall of man when that, that, that corrupt nature came? What then began to transpire on planet Earth? Why do the heathen rage? We saw it right away with Cain and Abel, didn't we? Yeah. Abel brought forth the offering as, as he had been instructed apparently through, from God and to Adam and Eve. and He brought forth an offering that was representative of Christ and him crucified. And, and, and God had saw that and because of that offering he declared him righteous. Cain brought forth an offering of what he devised and what he wanted to bring. And God rejected it. And then Cain began to rage. And he ended up taking the life of his brother Abel. Why did the heathen rage? Because man has fallen. And sin rules and reigns in his heart. Why did Cain kill Abel? We see a manifestation of that fallen nature. We see the manifestation of that corruption in mankind. We see that as we get to Genesis chapter 6 at the time we begin to see that God is preparing to pour out the rain and the flood and destroy the earth. Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Why? And that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Do you notice there what God said? The problem with the earth and the reason he judged it was because of the heart of man. Why did the heathen rage? Genesis 6, 11, right after it says, The earth was filled with violence. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah. Wouldn't you say today that the earth is filled with violence? Wouldn't you say that it's filled with bloodshed and, and everywhere you go? It wasn't psychological trauma that did it to them. It, it, it wasn't the environment and it wasn't the guns and it wasn't injustice. The problem was inside of man. Yes. You see, that's where the world's philosophies has everything backwards. Yes. Humanistic psychology says that the problem with man is the environment shapes and molds him and traumatizes him. The Word of God says, no, it's the exact opposite. This environment doesn't shape and mold mankind. We shape and mold the environment. What we see on planet Earth is a result of man's heart. Man's heart is not the result of the environment we live in. Jesus said, out of the heart of man. Yeah. And we look down to judge man. He says, because of what's inside of man, his imaginations are wicked yeah. and evil. Yeah. Continually. Throughout the book of Genesis, we see that over and over and over. Sodom and Gomorrah, people surrounded the house and tried to, 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 to kidnap the angels to have sexual relationships with them. Why do the heathen rage? Because the heart of man is wicked. That's very important to understand where we're going tonight. 
We can't understand if God's people how to respond to the problem if we don't properly understand the problem. And if you ask a lot of God's people today, what's going on in the world? What's the problem? You'll hear all kinds of ideas. But rarely will you hear because of the heart of man is wicked. That's right. That's right. Well, it's, it's the Democrats or it's the Republicans. It's a socialist. That's the problem. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's the heart of man. That word rage there is interesting. Tumultuous. Making a loud, confused noise. Uproaring. Confused and disorderly. Doesn't that sound like the nightly news? Didn't make it a loud noise. Isn't that what's going on in the time we live? Everybody's just making a loud noise. They're, they're confused and they're disorderly and they're in an uproar. As Pastor Mark was bringing out some of these things, we see that element so much in our society, in our time that we live. I mean, we've seen that over the last 10, 20 years. You know, I remember the, the court case where they, they threw a fit because the Ten Commandments was on a courthouse wall. You know, the people had thrown a fit because of nativity scenes in the yards. Or we see the obvious sin of abortion. Marriage and families are totally under attack. Marriage is almost non existent in our society. We hear the cry all the time. The one that I get the biggest kick out is separation of church and state. Why do I find that funny? Because it is the most prejudiced statement you could possibly ever hear. It doesn't ever say synagogue and state. It doesn't ever say mosque and state. It doesn't ever say temple and state. It's obviously zeroing in and narrowing out and focusing on one group of people and one group only. There's only one group of people on this planet who are church. That's right. Yeah. What a prejudice statement. So what I want to ask tonight is how has all of this affected our hearts? What has it done to us? to see it running wild and running rampant. What's it done to your heart? What is your heart's response to the problem? I'm going to make a political statement without making a political statement. And it's really not to be political. So please, if you take what I'm about to say and the example I'm about to use is political, you have missed my point. Yeah. I'm making a statement that is going to be focused on the heart of the church. And if you get mad about it, you'll be okay. You'll love me in a month or two. <laughs> Pastor Bob will preach on forgiveness Sunday morning. <laughs> Those of us who have been around for a minute, Pastor Bob, uh, <laughs> remember what, a time that we saw tremendous social unrest in our, in our country back in the 60s. I saw it very up close. When a lot of that was going on, I lived in North Carolina when all the, the, the racial stuff was going on. I quite honestly used to go into Raleigh and sit and watch riots for entertainment. I mean, it was happening very common. So we've seen that. And then we've seen a lot of other things that went on. And probably other than the time we live in now, that was probably the time when there was the most rage of the heathen and the unrest. Out of all of that, people like me, who never went to church before they were saved, came to Jesus Christ. Yeah. There, was, there was a movement, and you've heard a lot mention of it lately, called the Jesus Movement. The Jesus movement was the people who were preaching in the streets of California that led me to Christ. Prior to my salvation, I heard one sermon. And there was a lady standing on the street corner, Hollywood and Vine in Hollywood, preaching about the second coming of Christ. It was the only sermon I ever heard prior to my salvation. Never been in a church. If I would have had to go to a church to get saved, I would have never been saved. 
But there were people in the streets everywhere in Southern California at that time. And they, they, they had a passion, a passion for sharing Christ. And people say, what was the Jesus movement? Let me explain it to you. It's real easy. Christians witness to other people. That's it. The body of Christ had a passion to share Jesus with the lost people. So much they would go into the highways and the hedges and the streets or anywhere they had to go, in your schools, wherever it was, they had a passion burning on the inside of them to share Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world because they understood something. They knew why the heathen were raging and they knew that the words they needed to hear was, you must be born again. <laughs> I have seen that zeal and that excitement in the body of Christ in a problematic way in the last year. I've seen churches with a sudden zeal, with a sudden excitement, with a sudden passion, but it wasn't about the gospel. I've seen churches having prayer meetings that weren't for the lost. It was to get Donald Trump reelected. Now, I'm not knocking praying for our, pre our presidents, our leaders. The Word of God tells us to do that. I'm not knocking being involved in that. We are salt and we're light. But I'm going to challenge you tonight. If your passion is far greater for getting him reelected than it is for telling the lost about Jesus. You need to question your priorities. That's right. Amen. That's good. And that's not a political statement. No. That's an examination of our heart. Yes. And I've seen that in the body of Christ. People would pray and fast and do everything they could on social media to get the word out about certain political candidates and never mention Jesus to anybody while the world perishes. And there's going to be a key point on that that I'm going to get to tonight. This shows us why it's so important to understand that. I'm a patriotic person. I served in the military. My daddy served in the military. My uncle served in World War II. I mean, you go back to the family. We're military people. But our passion for the kingdom of God should be far greater than for the United States of America. Our passion for the lost should be far greater than our passion for the political scene. That's the difference between what we call the Jesus movement and call revival and what's going on in the church in a great degree now. Hallelujah. Pastor Bob will preach on forgiveness. You see, the thing that I want us to look at is distraction. All the stuff that Pastor Mark was referring to has distracted many Christians. You remember, good things can distract us. Good things can get us off focus. You remember right before Jesus ascended in the book of Acts? And they asked him, Jesus, are you going to now restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus had a really deep theological answer. Mike's paraphrase, it ain't none of your business. That's what he said. It's not for you to know that. Why? Because he says, no, here's your mission. That's not for you to know. That's not for you to worry about right now. That's not the mission of the church right now. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. You see, the mission of the church 
is take the gospel to a people, the heathen, who are raging and tell them about Jesus Christ. Because, beloved, we've got to understand something that as this world rages and as a heathen rage, the thing the enemy is most trying to do is to intimidate you and I from taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to them in the full power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And to get you and I distracted from the mission. Yes. And I fear that the body of Christ in America is a distracted people. Hallelujah. Do you remember Jesus weeping over Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He said, you're wonderful people. He said he wanted to gather them under his wings. But what did he say about them? Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them. Let me paraphrase. You, you, the raging heathen, I'm weeping over you because my desire is to bring you underneath my wings. You see, we've got to understand we can look at the world and we can look at the heathen and we can look at the darkness, but we've got to make sure, beloved, that our heart is right and it's like Jesus weeping over them and desiring to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to them in the full power of the Holy Spirit. We are to be a revival people in this time and this season and our heart has to be right for that to take place. We can't sit at home and complain about the world and expect God to move mightily. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus taught a parable. And in a parable, he talks about a man who leased out a vineyard. And it came harvest time. And he said, Now, you know, send some of the servants, go get my share. And they beat him and sent them back. Well, let's send some more servants. I'm not sure who volunteered for that job, but they went back. And they beat them and sent them back. Said, I sent my son. I know. I know they'll respect him. We all know what happened, don't we? Yeah. There comes the heir. Let's kill him. It'll all be ours. Yeah. God sent the prophets to the raging heathen. And, he, and, and they stoned them, and they've killed them. And God sent his son to the raging heathen because he loved them so much. He sent his son to die for the raging heathen so that they might be born again. Yes. Yes. Amen. Come on. How do we respond to the raging heathen? Do we sit at home and, and, and complain about the politicians? Do we sit at home and, and complain of, about the, all of the things going on today? How do we respond? Doom and gloom? Or are we the revival people? Yeah. What was God's motivation for all of that? For God so loved the world. There's a thing on YouTube I, I enjoy watching. There's a song Mercy Seat. I've had Nathan play it a few times. And the girl was singing it when they had the Brownsville Revival going on. And I, I've heard her testimony about it. It, it, it. The song always touches my heart because I heard her testimony about it. And she's singing. They're giving an altar call and she's singing the song Mercy Seat. Come run into the Mercy Seat. And uh, all of this, and all of a sudden she just kind of collapses in prayer, just crying out to God, broken. And, and I heard her interview and said, what happened? Why did you do that? And she says, because I looked out on the congregation, and the Lord in the Spirit showed me those who should be responding to Christ, but just sat there and didn't move. And she says, God filled me with his overwhelming love, and it broke me to see it. That's how we respond to the raging heathen, with the overwhelming love of God, if we're going to walk in revival. If such love dwells within God's people, 
How can we not be passionate about evangelism? If the same love that motivated God the Father to send His Son to die upon the cross lives on the inside of me, how can I not be passionate about the raging heathen the same way He is? Do you know how? Yes, Pastor, why don't you answer that? Distraction. Distraction. Even love could be distracted from the mission. How often have we heard stories or seen accounts where maybe somebody's child was kidnapped in a public place? You know, they go shopping and the parents would go shopping and you hear the, well, you know, right there at Walmart, somebody tucked my child and you hear them talking about, I, I, I can't believe that happened. I, I just, I don't know, I just looked away for a second. And when I looked back, my child was gone. Now, when they were watching over that child, did they love them? Absolutely. When they looked away for a second, did they love them? They did. But love was distracted. Love was distracted from the mission. And that's what I'm concerned about, beloved, in the body of Christ, that love is getting distracted. And we're getting wrapped up in so many things. And all of the chaos and all the confusion and all the darkness that's going on in the midst of us as the world crumbles before our eyes, we're being distracted and our love is not focused on the raging heathen to take the message of Jesus Christ to them. You can be filled with the love of God and be stressed out. By the times we live in. Yes, right. Maybe you just need a fresh touch of the love of God. Yes, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Yes. By the Holy Ghost. The mission is simple. If you go home tonight and in your neighborhood a house is on fire and it's your neighbors and you know three people's on the inside, what do you do first? You go inside and get the people out, don't you? You don't put the fire out. You get the people out. And I think, beloved, sometimes the body of Christ has got that backwards. I think we see the houses on fire, but we're trying to put the fires out rather than trying to get the people out. You see, our mission is simple. God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Yeah. All the craziness in the world, it's harvest time. Yes, it All the broken people by this world system has broken people, that's harvest time. Yeah. All the people who are in bondage because of this world system, that's harvest time. Yeah. All of the things we see going on in the world and people hopeless and in despair, behold, that's harvest time. Yeah. But we have to be a people who's strong enough and powerful enough that we're going to go and minister to the raging heathen no matter how dark it looks. Yeah. There's things we might have to do to make sure that happens. I know most of you probably don't remember, but there was a a movie with David Wilkerson and Nicky Cruz crossing a switchblade long, long time ago, back in the day, like the 50s. And uh, it, it was very tame. The movie was very tame compared to the actual story. And if you ever heard the actual story from the testimonies of Nicky Cruz and David Wilkerson, it was far more brutal than they could show on TV or in a movie at that time. I mean, Nicky Cruz was the gang leader in New York, and God sent Wilkerson to minister to him and witness to him. And, you know, they show Cruz being a little rough with Wilkerson in, uh, in the movie. But in actuality, Nicky Cruz and the gang members virtually almost beat David Wilkerson to death on several occasions. And Nicky Cruz, in his testimony, will tell you that the last thing that really got his heart was the last time they beat Wilkerson. He got up and he said, Nicky Cruz, you can cut me to pieces and spread me throughout this city and every single piece will cry out that God loves you. 
He took the love of God to the screaming heathen. He took the love of God to the raging heathen. Now this is easy to preach. Some things are easy to preach but hard to live. And that's what we need to really look at. Is that our life? Is that how we're living? Or is it just a sermon? Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, that sounds easy, don't it? Just follow Jesus. But then again, you look at how Jesus described following him. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come follow me. Oh, well, you know, all of that stuff sounds good, Pastor. I mean, going and, 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 and ministering and taking the gospel to the raging heathen, that all sounds wonderful, but that's just not me. That's not my personality. Now, I've dealt with people in witnessing and taught classes and done it for years. I've heard that a million times. Can I tell you what Jesus says about that? That's why me has to die on the cross. That's why me has to deny themselves to follow Jesus. Remember, Jesus came down from glory. And he lived for the Father's will. He says, I never do my will. And he went upon the cross and he died. Yes. He said, come follow me. Come follow me. Follow him. Do the Father's will. Follow him. Deny yourself. Follow him. Take up the cross daily. You see, beloved, if we're going to be sincere about this, and we talk about revival, we preach about revival, we pray for revival, we're all about revival, revival's coming. Maybe. If we don't do this, it's not. Oh, great harvest is coming in. Not if we don't tell the screaming heathen they need to be born again. Not if you and I aren't walking in the full power of the Holy Spirit and proclaiming the gospel. Not if we aren't willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. I want to share. You know... We're familiar with the Great Supper. You know, that great feast they had. And go out and invite those who are bidden, and they all had excuses. Well, you know, I can't come. I, I just bought some oxen, and I bought some land, and I got married. And, you know, the, the father, go on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. That my house might be full. Well, then the tr there's a transition. He says, then people, many people followed him, and he stopped and turned. And when he stopped and turned, he said something. You remember the passage where it says, if you don't love me more than you love your mother and your father and your so on and so forth, and if you're not willing to forsake all to come follow me, you can't be my disciple? Yes. If a general, before he goes into battle, he first sets and does he have the resources to win the battle? And if you build a tower, you first sit down and do I have the resources to finish that tower? That's what you have to do to follow Jesus. You see, we're in an interesting time. I believe with all of my heart this is the greatest season of revival the church has ever seen. But I also believe with all of my heart if we don't understand the stuff I'm talking about, we miss it. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. It's not like we sit at home and God says, okay, revival's here now. Okay, praise the Lord. I share with you. And I'm going to read one more scripture and I'm going to close, I promise. I've got to look at what time I started. but um, I'm a short-winded preacher normally anyway. There's never been a time in my life personally where God has moved in me, in my heart, like He is today. There's never been a time in my life when the Spirit of God has moved upon me about two things that we're talking about prayer and consecration like he is today. And I talk to a lot of believers and it's the same thing. The question is, do we answer the call and listen to the Holy Spirit? Now I'm going to do something again. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Is Joe back there? Are you awake? 
Romans 1.16, oh, it's Sue. And I'm going to share something with you, and I'm not one to share my heart and my life a lot. I'm not comfortable doing that. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. She will give you an amen. <laughs> What'd she say? Oh, that's right. There's a lot of difference between standing up and preaching God's word and sharing your life and your heart. I never forget one time I was asked, one of the first times I really gave my testimony, second time I gave my testimony, was I was asked to do it by a, a ministry in Peoria, and it was me and uh, Richard Pryor's kid and uh, somebody else. And I was terrified. And people just kind of laughed at me and said, why are you so nervous? You get in front of people and preach all the time. I said, there's a lot of difference between expounding God's word and sharing my life. But I want to tell you about a stronghold. And how I think that the enemy is affecting people today that we live. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now if I was to go around and ask probably everybody here, they would say, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, nor am I. Probably most Christians would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let me share with you how the enemy may operate in this area. That word ashamed is very simple. To have a feeling of fear or shame. Shame is a tremendous stronghold in the lives of believers quite often. We don't think of it a lot in that capacity. I can remember back in my... Uh, grandparents' generation, and some of you may have had family members who did, they had a thing they did they called shaming kids. And if a kid did something, they'd call them out. They'd give them here to do it and try to make that child feel the shame so that they wouldn't do it again. Now, my grandparents didn't do that to me. But I lived in a household and grew up with a tremendous stronghold of shame in my life. And the reason was both of my parents were extremely severe alcoholics. I've seen my dad every few months. Most of the days when I went home, my mom was passed out somewhere in the household. And that was my life for years. I, you think I brought my friends home? Why not? Because I was ashamed of my home. Do you think every, everything about my life, and I don't want to go into all the details, as a child, was shame. And then, lo and behold, I, I started drinking alcohol with them at probably five or six years old. And I always knew what it was to catch a buzz, and I always liked it. And then, at the age of 13, like I said, I started doing drugs rather heavily. And I say, why? It never occurred to me not to. And if you've ever had any background like that or any history like that, with drug addiction also comes a lot of shame. You're ashamed of who you are. You're ashamed while you're walking in bondage. You're ashamed you can't stop. You're ashamed you can't do what other people are doing. You're ashamed of the things you do to get drugs. It's a life of shame. And so I came to Christ and it... it at the time, I don't think I really even realized it, how much that was a stronghold in my life. And I began to study and who I was in Christ and all of that and began to really come out of that to a great degree. But to a degree, I never completely came out of that and spent the bulk of my life, no matter where I was at, no matter what I was doing, I felt like everybody else was here. And I was here, no matter what I was doing. Years after I preached, I felt like all preachers were here, and I was here. If you put me in a room full of other ministers, they were here, and I was here. No matter what I did, no matter what I did, I always felt that in my heart. You see, the world and the devil knows if we have shame in our heart. 
And one of the devices he will greatly use is shame. And one of the main ways that the enemy is attacking the body of Christ today is through shame. I went through that and I came a little bit out of that. And some other things happened in life that triggered that again. And I walked battling that for years and not understanding how much. Now, if we are not a healed people in areas like that, the enemy can easily stop us from taking the gospel to the heathen who are in our age. Let me give you an example. If I go to the heathen and I'm going to share Jesus with them, but ultimately inside of me, I feel like they're here and I'm here. And when I try to give them the gospel, they immediately begin to play shame cards. What are their shame cards? Homophobe. Narrow-minded. Ignorant. Foolish. Intolerant. Sexist. Terrorist. If you were educated, you would know better than that. They've got all kinds of shame cards that they are playing on the body of Christ in the day we live. Why? Because the enemy knows he can stop you. And if you have things like that in our hearts, the enemy knows there's a button I can push. We have to be a people who are consecrated. We have to be a people who's not distracted. But we have to be a people who are healed and delivered and whole. To walk in revival. I want to show you one last thing. I said that before again. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> Third time. Oh, come on. Well, he, he, I, okay. And here's the whole closing point that I've been leading up to the whole time. Okay. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Let me show you God's answer for revival. Yeah. And I'm going to show you with proper hermeneutics for Pastor Bob. That it applies to Psalm number 2. And why the heathen rage? Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Here's where I believe we are. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Now we understand that this is the, the, the body of Christ, the early church has gathered together after, they, after Peter and John told the man to rise up and walk in Acts chapter 3 and he was healed and they were kind of taken through the, the, the system there and then they were told not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus again and they, went, they left and they gathered together in prayer. So exactly what I'm talking about had taken place. And now Lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Yes. But stretch forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, for the purpose of proper hermeneutics, proper hermeneutic, hermeneutic, let's go to verse 23 and show you that they have been 100% absolute in context. And being let go, this is after they were threatened, intimidated, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, there's their prayer meeting, and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. 
for the truth against thy holy child Jesus, so on and so forth. We understand that before he prayed the prayer, he quoted Psalm 2 and says, this is our response to the raging of the heathen who are trying to stop the gospel from going forth. This is our response to the devil and what he's trying to do. And we're going to ask God to counteract this and pour out his Holy Spirit. And so we may speak the word of God with boldness and do signs and wonders and miracles in the name of Jesus. I propose to you tonight, beloved, there is no other other answer other than an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God of boldness and see signs and wonders and miracles and revival in the day and the hour we live and let the heathen rage but let the name of Jesus be glorified hallelujah glory to God let him rage let him rage let him rage but the name of Jesus will be exalted by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Word. Yes. Uh, That's our part. Praise God. That's our part. Yes. I'm praying yes. for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit right here in central Illinois. Yes. Yeah. I'm bold. Yes. I used to, I've read about revivals and studied revivals all my life. Yeah. I can't find any reason in the Word of God where we can't have the Sousa Street in Pekin, Illinois. That's right. Come on. Come on. I'm asking, can somebody show me a single verse that tells me that prayer is not valid? That's right. I don't see any reason why we can't have the greatest revival the world's ever seen right now. Yeah. But we can't allow ourselves to be distracted. That's right. We've got to allow God to deal with stuff in our hearts and our lives. And revival at this level requires consecration at this level. The greatest revival the world's ever seen, Pastor, preach it, requires the greatest consecration that the world's ever seen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am so locked in and hungry for God to pour out His Spirit. And I'm so 100% convinced that actually nothing else is sufficient. Mark gave us the mess. Only an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church for the purpose of bringing in the harvest is sufficient. We're not going to put the fire out, but let's get the people out of the fire. Amen? I think I'm done. I better hush. If I can be going to another scripture, you guys will call me out on it.